Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. With growing interest in the sheep and goat industries, producers are turning to a method to protect their herds that's been around for centuries. SUNUP's Curtis Hare takes us to the OSU Range Research Station to learn more. From a distance, it appears there's an extra furry goat in the herd. But after a closer look, you'll see it's an animal that's been used to protect livestock for over a thousand years. A dog. So they're Akbosh. Uh, it's a pretty new dog. It's uh, from Tur the country of Turkey. Well, when I say guard dog for goats or sheep, a lot of people are going to think Great Pyrenees. They're still big white dogs. They just don't have that really long hair coat. Cooper Sherrill is an Oklahoma State Extension Research Assistant and is overseeing a study looking into the movements between guard dogs and their herd. Using GPS tracking on both the dogs and the goats, Cooper says giving Oklahoma livestock producers a full picture on these guardians of the prairie is the ultimate goal. So as the sheep and goat industry continues to grow, I think there's going to be a need for even more guard dogs in the future, obviously. And, you know, the, the people of, of Oklahoma need to have some science behind what they're trying to uh, implement out in their pastures. While this research is exciting, these OSU guard dogs are actually a small part of a larger study. Extension researchers from OSU, Texas A&M, and the University of Nebraska are collaborating to study a two-pronged approach in controlling woody plant encroachment in the southern Great Plains. The approach? Patch burning and grazing goats in the pasture. You know, with that two-pronged system, we've got both the fire and the goats. And, you know, to have the goats, we got to have the dogs. The dogs allow me to go to sleep better at night. So before we brought in the goats, predators were not a problem out here with the cattle. Um, every once in a while you'd see a coyote near a new calf that had been born, but now that we have such uh, smaller animals, um, you know, they're not as intimidating to a coyote. Cooper says the research team tried using donkeys to protect the goats at first, but still lost several kits to coyotes during the kidding season. Oklahoma Extension Wildlife Specialist Dwayne Elmore says having a coyote problem is not uncommon in Oklahoma. The primary predator that's going to be a problem with uh, livestock is coyotes. They're, they're very uh, widespread and abundant, so almost all the predation that we see on livestock is due to coyotes. So goats and sheep are particularly susceptible, um, and obviously pol poultry as well, uh, you know, so smaller animals. Uh, but, you know, newborn calves are at risk, particularly if the, if the cow is not very protective. Tall fencing and lethal measures are popular methods in controlling coyotes, but both can be counterproductive especially killing the animal. These coyotes have territories and they're defended territories. So when you take a coyote out, it's usually a vacuum that's filled in quickly and sometimes by more coyotes. So you might actually increase your predation problems. But often, you know, if you're in an area where there's a lot of dogs that are roaming free, domestic dogs that are roaming free or, and or feral dogs that are being dumped, that might be your bigger problem. Um, just and, and they might not even be killing the livestock, but just the constant harassment and barking and chasing them into fences. So, you know, a good guard dog is going to spend all its time right with the herd, and it's, it's wary and on guard for other, uh, you know, canids, coyotes that might come around. Since we've got the dogs out here working with the goats, we haven't had any losses. Guard dogs can be a great asset to a sheep and goat operation. But you can't just throw any old dog out in the pasture and expect good results. The type of breed and bonding the animal to the herd are critical factors. A lot of the whole guard dog thing starts when they're a puppy. From about eight weeks to about 20 weeks old, that's a really critical period um, in getting them bonded to your livestock and, and set up in your area. Once the herd recognizes the dog as a protector, that bond is as strong as a rusted bolt in a strip nut. Wherever the dog goes, the goats go. You know, there are some drawbacks to having guard dogs. It's, it's an initial expense and, and you know, they take veterinary care and, and, and there's, there's a risk that, you know, they might injure um, someone's pet that comes too close to the livestock, but they're highly effective at protecting livestock if they're trained. The guard dog study in the Prairie Project will continue for the next few years and the pups will keep doing what they're doing. Standing watch, wary and ready with the goats falling closely behind. In Payne County, I'm Curtis Hare.
On last week's Cow-Calf Corner, we visited with you about the basics of body condition scoring of beef cows. We're just trying to determine the fleshiness of those cows at different times of the year. And that's a, an indication of the nutritional status of the cows. And of course, we know it's going to affect reproduction. There have been a number of research trials done across the United States, different experiment stations, looking at what impact body condition at different times of the cow production year has on uh, the reproductive uh, performance of these beef cows. The one that shows up the most is having the most impact on whether the cow is going to recycle and rebreed on time for next year's calf crop is the body condition that she's in the day that she calves. If you look at this graphic, what you see is those cows that are in that body condition score four or less. The four cows only rebred on an average of about 60%. The cows that were in that body condition score five category did much better. Once we got cows that were in that body condition score six category, they had enough stored body energy, enough adipose or fat tissue stored on them that it didn't seem to matter as much as to what happened to them after calving going into the breeding season. They rebred at a very high percentage rate on an average about 92%. A more recent study done about seven years ago looked at body condition of cows in the very late part of pregnancy whether they were in that body condition score of a high five, very close to a six that we've talked about, compared to those that were in the four category. They were about halfway between a four and a five. Again, the same kind of a graph would show up in those two groups. The cows that were in that good body condition right before calving rebred after a 60 day breeding season at a 92% rate. The cows that were in that body condition score four to five only rebred at a 79% rate. Quite a huge difference. And so it looks to me like it's one of those things where as much as times change, that one biologically stays the same. Those cows in good body condition will tend to recycle quicker and have a better chance to rebreed in the upcoming uh, breeding season than will those cows that are in thinner body condition that we know are gonna take many more days between calving and recycling, and therefore they have a lower probability of rebreeding the next year going around. We hope this gives you a better idea of the impact of body condition on reproduction and how it affects your herd. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. So many times on the show we talk about soil quality and Josh there is there's some opportunities for producers to to take a look at things that may help crops in the future like no-till versus conventional till. Yeah there's a lot of options and, and the good thing is is it's been a focus recently you know improving soil quality not only that a lot of people focus on the quality but we're also talking about resilience uh, just making it to where it maybe it doesn't improve but it doesn't get worse right. and, and I think those are very important tasks and, and like I said there's a lot of practices that are being of, of major focus not only at, at here at OSU other land-grant institutions as well as governmental agencies like the NRCS focusing on good soil quality because it is about soil quality but then it also helps with crop selections and, and, and things that you can grow and in turn it, you may not see it the first year, but it, you're, you're gonna get better crops. Yeah, and that's where we go on to the resilience aspect is, is you know, we've, we've talked to a lot of growers on what they want. And, and when you talk about conservation practices, ultimately we need to make money. Yeah. But on down there, top three is, I, I just want the droughts to not be as, as negative. We can do that with good coverage, maintaining that soil in place, good organic matter, building your microbial communities, or even doing something like we're looking at here and diversifying, looking at what kind of forage a cover crop can do. So we're improving the soil, but also trying to integrate the livestock into the system. We're all too familiar with that in Oklahoma's integrating the livestock. Let's do it in a way that also can improve the livestock of the soil or that soil microbial community through a soil quality aspect. Or we're going from a flood two days to a drought, and that's always how it's gonna be. 
we can help mod uh, moderate that by, by actually having some of these practices in that can make it to where, yeah, we might be under a drought, but two days later, we, or we might, might be flooded, but two days later, we're not under a drought. And, and these type of systems can do that kind of stuff. Improving your water infiltration, getting that subsoil moisture is very important. Um, but, but the other thing we have to worry about is how we manage those systems. And, and that's, we can't be too focused on the crop and, and the, the economics, and we can't be too focused on the soil quality and resilience. We have to meet somewhere in the middle to make things work. And I think that's where we need to, we need to get more information on how we can grab components of each of them to make a system that growers can actually implement and be not only economically sound, but environmentally sound and sustainable. That's the ultimate goal. And that's, that's kind of what we're looking for on, on projects like this and in projects like these no-till work. You, you use the word system in there a lot of times. It's not just happenstance, hey, I think I'm gonna plant wheat this year. I think I'm gonna do this this year. It, it's really developing a plan, a, a five-year goal for, for that plot of land and, and, and improving the soil quality, but then also seeing what crops may work in that year. It, that's, that's something that maybe producers need to look at. Yeah, and, and there's, there's sometimes that I, I like long-term rotations that sustain indifferent of, of the commodity price. It's not 100% feasible. That, that is, in, in theory, I like that kind of system. Why? Because you can start planning for it. Uh, you know, I'm growing soybean that doesn't have a whole lot of residue, so I'm going to put in a cover crop or something along those lines to kind of bridge that gap between there. However, we have to start thinking about the long term. As soon as we cover our short term, our long term bases are where we need to start, start looking at. And, and the other thing that we need to think of is, is a lot of folks are starting to drop no-till because of weeds. Right. Um, we can work with that. We can work, the, it, it's not time to completely tear up all the no-till, but, but we have to do a little trial and error. We have to kind of almost take two steps back sometimes, take five steps forward instead of a, a step back to take a, a step forward. So, you know, look, look, at, look at that system approach and, and a lot of people talk about soil quality or, or plant health or various things. And, and that's what I, I like to look at system quality. How, how well is the system going? Not only the soil quality, but are you making money? Is things doing good? Are you decreasing your reliance on inputs that, that we just don't need? And, and I think that's, that's very important is, is moderating your inputs and, and, and trying to make things sustainable. That way, four, five, 10 years down the line, we can still do the things that we're doing right now. Find what works out best for you and, and try, to, try to manage and manipulate it as best you can to, to think of your long-term goals. And that's what I always suggest growers doing is, is finding those year, five-year and 10-year goals, what they want for their property to, to really get long-term stability to it. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Josh Lofton, Cropping System Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Welcome to the Mesonet Weather Report, I'm Wes Lee. One of the most important factors for crop production is soil moisture. At Mesonet, we utilize an electronic soil moisture sensor seen in this picture buried to either 2, 4, 10, or 24 inches in the soil profile to determine soil moisture. Sensors are under existing native sod as well as under a chemically treated bare soil. Data is presented in two different ways, 
first is the fractional water index, abbreviated as FWI, and the second is plant available water, or PAW. This is an example of the FWI at four inches at the beginning of the week. FWI uses a scale of zero to one. Zero means it is as dry as the sensor can read and one is as wet as it can be read. FWI is not soil type dependent and is a good method to use to determine water percolation after a rain event. PAW is more complex. Here moisture is presented in either total inches at that depth or a percentage of what the maximum water holding capacity is. It is very soil type dependent. PAW uses a complex algorithm to estimate the soil moisture above and below the sensor depth. For example, a 16 inch PAW uses two sensors, two and 10 inches, to estimate all the water in a slice of soil 16 inches deep. It is not available if soils are frozen. Now you know a little more about soil moisture measurements. Remember, your soil type and rainfall will likely vary somewhat from your local mesonet site. Gary is now going to discuss the newly released winter forecast maps. Thanks, Wes, and good morning, everyone. I thought this would be a good time to take a look at our long-term outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center for both temperature and precipitation. Uh, so these will be our winter outlooks just released and giving us an idea of uh, what we might expect uh, over the next three months. Well, let's do just December 1st. Again, from the Climate Prediction Center, the temperature outlook shows increased odds of above normal temperatures across most of the southern U.S. and up into the eastern seaboard, uh, but again, over Oklahoma, so above normal temperatures are expected over the winter months. For precipitation, we see above normal odds. For below normal uh, precipitation, increased odds for below normal precipitation, uh, rather, across the entire state, but especially across the western half of the state, including the Panhandle. Um, so at least for December, warmer than normal and drier than normal conditions are expected, especially across western Oklahoma. That would not be good news for the drought uh, that we've seen in that part of the state, of course. Now let's take a look at the next three months. This will again be for December through February. First, for temperature, we see increased odds of above normal temperatures across the entire state. A little bit higher odds across the far southern reaches of Oklahoma, um, but again for the entire state, expected to be warmer than normal as we go through December through February. Now for precipitation, again just like with December, we see increased odds of below normal precipitation, especially across the western uh, two-thirds of the state, and even more especially across the southwestern quarter of the state. So uh, again, for those areas that are suffering from drought across western Oklahoma, this would definitely not be good news. So if we look at the seasonal drought outlook from the Climate Prediction Center, this goes through the end of February. That's pretty much the picture of what we saw in those outlooks. Drought is expected to persist and even develop. Uh, it's expected to be likely across much of the state, that's the area in yellow, um, through the next three months. So drought development likely in areas that don't see it now and it's expected to persist or possibly even intensify where it already exists. So that's definitely not good news. So we have to hope these outlooks are uh, about as good as the paper they're printed on. Sometimes they are, but when we have La Nina present like now, uh, sometimes they're a little bit more accurate. So we just have to hope that uh, those are actually wrong this time and we get some drought relief in here. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. If you're like me and you have a few animals around, like these sheep, uh, you're bound to determine at some point in time to have an orphan. And for me this year, we've had a little bad luck. We've lost a dam. We've had one with mastitis. And we've had some that just abandoned. And on occasion, you have a ewe that has too many babies to take care of. So that leaves you with the dilemma, what are you gonna do with these little guys? The most important thing that we have to do at the start is make sure these guys get colostrum. So you're either going to have to find a, another ewe that has lambed at the same time and try to steal a little bit from her, or if you were thinking ahead, if you had a ewe that just had a single and you milked some out and froze it, now's the time to use that. As a last resort, you can use a replacer, but be sure and use a colostrum replacer, not a supplement, because the supplements will not have enough immunoglobulins to do you any good. Once you've done that, you want to remember also to dip that navel so you don't have to deal with any infections later on. 
Now at this time you're going to have to select a milk replacer. Be sure and select the milk replacer that's species specific. So if you're going to have sheep, you want to get a sheep replacer. If you've got goats, get a kid replacer. If you've got cattle, you'll want to get a calf replacer. Those milk replacers are going to fit the are going to meet the requirements that those little babies need. So a calf replacer is not going to meet the needs of a lamb. It's not going to be high enough in protein or fat. So do your homework before you pick one. Next, you're going to have to decide how we're going to feed these guys. Are we going to feed them by a bottle? Are we going to set up some type of self-feeder? If you've got several or you've got a large herd, you may actually want to get an automatic uh, feeder for these guys. You know, initially, like in our case, we choose to bottle feed. We're going to have to feed several times in those first few days. We want to give about 10% of their body weight. We're going to give four or five feedings in a 24-hour period. After a few days, we try to get to three times a day. Once we get to about two weeks, we're going to try to get them to be taking a bottle every two, two, two times per day. The other thing you want to start doing at that time is you want to get you you want to start getting these guys on a feed. Pick you a good high quality feed, start getting them to eat some of that. If you have any more questions about how to raise orphan babies, I'll put some information on the website at sunup at okstate.edu. Dr. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, let's kick things off talking about whether producers should price wheat for 2021 delivery. Well, I think the market's offering a relatively good price for harvest delivery in 21. If you go back over the last five years, it's a really good price. Uh, Northern Oklahoma, it's $5.50. If you go to Texas Panhandle, Oklahoma Panhandle, or Southern Oklahoma, about $5.35. That's a relatively good price. I wouldn't get all crazy on, on how much I forward contracted, but I would forward contract some so I could sleep at night. How about pricing stored wheat? I think it's time to do that also. Prices have been slightly higher if you go back back about a month, but if you go back to June and July, you know, we're looking at a dollar and a quarter higher prices. It looks like wheat prices have peaked out for a while, so I would probably start staggering it into the market and move some of that wheat out of storage. In terms of news in the market, kind of what's bubbling around that makes you think some producers should price some wheat? Uh, it's the uh, world production, world ending stocks. World production over 28 billion bushels, a record. If you look at world ending stocks, the projection, it's a, also a record and the world stocks to use ratio is a record. So there's a lot of wheat around the world that can move in the market and that I think is going to keep a top on these prices. Are there any producers who shouldn't price 2021 wheat? Oh, I think that's producers that can afford a risk. Now we've got record world production in stocks, but if you look at flour milling wheat, flour milling stocks are below average coming out of the Black Sea in the United States. Plus you've got some weather problems in the, in the United States and in Russia that could reduce that 21 crop. Now I must point out that in Russia, Planted acres are 9% higher than last year, and one analyst said that that 9% increase in acres could offset any potential drop in yield from weather. And we know that our yields, our production is March, April, and May, not right now. What about corn and beans? What are you seeing there? Well, if you look at uh, corn prices, the corn prices are still an uptrend that has slowed down quite a bit. There's some talk that we could be near a top in corn. That's going to depend on what China does. If you look at soybeans, soybeans has been on a tear. I mean, it's just going up like gangbusters. The trend is your friend. And if I had soybeans, I'd let it run for a while. So corn, I'd move some in the market. I'd probably sell a little bit, make sure I got this $11 beans. That is, I mean, go back four months ago, you'd have given your eye teeth for $11 beans, so take some of it now. I'd probably hold some to sell later on. Okay, great advice, Kim. Thanks a lot. And now a word from our colleague, Dr. Amy Hagerman, about some upcoming crop insurance deadlines. Last year, producers were able to make their decision on their farm safety net programs for their crops. This is your agricultural risk coverage or your price loss coverage option. And they made that election decision for both the 2019 and the 2020 crop year. Starting October 12th, we reopened into a new election period. This was new in this farm bill. Producers had the option if they felt like market circumstances were changing or their crop circumstances were changing to actually change their election. 
going into the next year. Uh, now, we have had some changes in our crop prices going into this fall, but we have a lot of uncertainty going into the spring as well. So that choice between the price loss coverage program is really gonna come down to those reference prices. For the crops that you have enrolled, and remember that's based on your base acreage, not on your actual planted acreage for the 2021 crop year, you're gonna to have to make that decision. Have the crop prices changed in a way that we're gonna trigger in PLC for the 2021 crop year, or are we more likely to see some sort of payment under the agricultural risk coverage, which would account for yield as well. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit of a tricky decision going into this year. I think waiting a little bit, finding out more about price expectations going into the next year would be a good idea because we have until March 15th to finalize that election and to enroll. Now that's another important point. Even if you're not changing your election, you still have to enroll in the next year. So either way, that's a conversation with your FSA office. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime online at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.